Those seated conditions and the root assumptions, the paradigm that you're coming from, have everything to do with what your conclusions for action in the world are going to be. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. This is a show about regenerative finance, exploring pathways to a life-affirming economy. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and today's guests are David McConville and Don Danby, co-founders of Spherical. Spherical is a strategic design and integrative research studio working to regenerate the health and integrity of Earth's living systems. They do this through ecological visualization, immersive learning, regenerative development, and ontological repair. We get into what all of that means, and we go deep into a project Spherical is currently working on in the Los Angeles Basin and Watersheds in partnership with Accelerate Resilience LA. We also talk more philosophically about technology, its limitations and assumptions, indigenous knowledge, AI, and David emphasizes the importance of examining the dark side of technology and how it can be gamed by bad actors. I find this conversation important for a number of reasons. I like how David and Don are bringing the focus onto water, not just climate, and dealing with the messy realities of different jurisdictions and urban contexts, which is of course where most people live. They've also found pragmatic ways to unlock the grants process through community engagement and appropriate technology while ultimately helping people get in closer relationship with their local watersheds. So strap in and prepare to have your horizons expanded with this discussion with David McConville and Don Danby. We are here with Don Danby and David McConville. They're the co-founders of Spherical. Thank you both for being here. A delight. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start from the top. What is Spherical? Sort of in the basic level, it's a, we call it integrative research uh, studio. Mm. And we <clears throat> created a container to explore ideas and cultivate projects about seven years ago. Um, really looking for things that we think needed to exist in the world mm -hmm. with no real plan of how we were going to fund it or exactly what the strategy was going to be. It mostly came out of frustration of seeing things that weren't happening. Mm. And so when we started the studio, it was just the two of us. Um, and we began exploring a lot of different directions. We did a project uh, with early on with some folks, which I think you're familiar with, uh, an initiative through the, 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 the Commonwealth of Nations uh, that became Common Earth. Um, that was an idea of like, how do you apply regenerative practices to this, you know, the sort of the, the, the shell of the former empire, <laughs> um, which was filled with paradoxes. Um, and we did art installations around concepts of Gaian systems. We've done a lot of work around mapping regenerative projects around the world. Um, and different explorations of, of ideas while it was the two of us, but starting around three years ago, we started to grow. So we now have almost, well, 17 folks on the team, uh, very, very diverse crew of folks. So really we are a creative studio that is incubating projects. Mm. Um, and it includes people who are software developers, creative, um, artists, uh, product leads, as well as a whole crew of folks who work very much on on-the-ground engagement, specifically on work uh, across Los Angeles County right now. Mm. And, and you mentioned, you know, part of the motivation was to do things that you felt like you, you were seeing not happen. Mm. And maybe a bit more context at, at the outset here of like, what were the experiences that led you to Spherical? And what were some of those observations that you were having? Sure. Do you want to take your most immediate experience before the studio? I mean, yeah, you know, I've been working in, in sustainability and ecological design, circularity, whatever, many different names um, mm -hmm. since the late 90s. And I'd spent 
you know, 10 years in that intervening time, um, leading sustainable design efforts at Autodesk. So I was very focused on the question of, okay, you got designers and engineers making the built environment, making all the manufactured things. How do we get into the tools they're using, give them the analytical capacity to transform what gets made? Mm. And, that, and that will change the world. Um, and that is still ongoing. That is still wonderful work that, that's, that has a lot of potential. But it was really focused on what was quantifiable or seen as valuable. And so the longer I spent inside an organization mm. doing that, um, and as the space of sustainability evolved, there were um, there was more and more and more of a narrowing function so that everything was focused on carbon or materials. Right. And how do we optimize for those things? Right. And working on that for 10 years, even though I came into this work because of a deep relationship with trees on the west coast of Canada and, you know, deep resonance with the, my home watershed in the Great Lakes in Canada, all of that got squeezed out and all of a sudden I was just looking very much at numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, and with that squeezing out of the ecology, of the life systems, of the human systems, also my will got squeezed out. <laughs> so mm. I was basically totally nihilistic at the end of that. And uh, and David actually came over and started showing me all these projects about people regenerating their places, all in totally different ways, and and uh, and sharing some of the work of um, of Bill Reed and Carol Sanford. And I remember at the time being like, "Is this real, though? Mm. Like it?" I mean, I work with real companies and I tell you what, you know, it was just, I had gotten right. to such a point of not seeing potential anymore mm. that once I leaned into seeing what this kind of transformation could look like, um, I was able to kind of regain my will, but I couldn't do that from within the system I was in. Mm. <laughs> I had to, we had to really start spherical to dive in. And I guess I came along a resonant path starting in the late 90s doing a lot of uh, work with networking technology, with very early internet open source stuff, getting more and more into where I was at the time at UNC Chapel Hill, early virtual reality, and then immersive displays and data visualization, and uh, uh, doing that for many years in the context of both sort of industry and art, um, became more and more interested in how perception can shift uh, comprehension and understanding, particularly of planetary systems. Mm. So uh, co-founded a company called the Illuminati over 20 years ago now, making these immersive displays. And pretty quickly we found that it was sort of like the working with planetary data, planetary systems, cosmic data, science centers was really the, the highest and best use of the tools in many mm. ways. Still is. It's still that's very actively going on. And so that drove me more and more into the question of like, okay, what's the, the ways in which these types of immersive spaces have been used, even ritualistically, and are used right. to help to connect to the, the nested scales of existence, right? And you can look right. at that from a religious perspective, you can look at that from a scientific perspective, but it's the same basic kind of cognitive mm -hmm. you know, phenomena that are going on when people are in these places. And so I spent many years working with a pretty transdisciplinary team of scientists and artists and educators thinking about how to use immersive spaces for relating the nature of the nested scales of existence of the life of the planet. And in the process of doing that, ended up getting a grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in the U.S. and for four years ran a project called the Worldviews Network where we were doing custom productions for places all over the United States that we were calling bioregional community dialogues. And it was about helping communities to understand the nested scales and different phenomena and metabolisms of their own communities mm. that they could then hopefully, you know, in some actionable way, <laughs> become engaged right. in working with those. We did projects here in San Francisco on um, indigenous practices like controlled burning, you know, cultural burning. Um, in California, it was about migration, or sorry, excuse me, in New York City, it was about migration of birds and how they were being harmed by some of the, mm. you know, the architecture there. I mean, there was just a lot of different uh, topics that we were taking on that were very specific and unique to those bioregions or urban environments. What I realized in the course of doing that project was that we, I was woefully, uh, you know, prepared to um, manage how those dialogues land and evolve and develop and 
and develop new capacities with communities. Mm. And so we were having kind of reboot every time we went somewhere else. And that means right. we would leave the old place. And our, our hope was that we would kind of seed the conditions for how we were using the tools, particularly in planetariums, for sort of helping people to connect at the level of all the dynamism and interactions and relationships that enable life on the planet mm -hmm. that could then be used, you know, in a, in a longer term way in those places, which happened to some degree. But I also just realized, like, I, I had no idea how to do sort of collective mm. work. And so then spent the next 10 years really doing a deep study of uh, trying to find the folks that were doing that well mm. <laughs> and ended up finding the folks involved in the world of regenerative development um, and have been working closely with Regenesis ever since um, and trying to understand how can technology and, and different types of computation technologies be in service of these kind of regenerative processes and what could that look like, uh, you know, in, in various contexts um, and, you know, and kind of the, the, the missing piece of it was oftentimes the accessibility you know, that it was a lovely luxury to have access to all of this hardware and kit to bring people into these immersive spaces and do all these things. But it was just like, it was mm. pretty, you know, a uh, high barrier to entry. Mm. And so in starting Spherical, it was really looking at like, okay, how can we bring these things into like very, very pragmatic on the ground processes in communities? How can we start to integrate a lot of the incredible ideas that are, are, behind kind of framework thinking mm -hmm. so that communities can really work together and develop new capacities and, mm -hmm. you know, and what role can technology play to be in service of those, you know, the, the, the healing of those living systems, whether they're human social systems or whether the, you know, the, the broader ecological systems that they're embedded in. Mm. Yeah. So well said. Okay. I have so many questions, but, um, but I did want to start at the outset. Our mutual friend, Alexa Fermanish, told me to ask you, why do you call it spherical? Um, I wrote 700 pages on this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Link in the show notes. Yeah, 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 what's the show notes? What's the abstract? Um, I am a fan of using metaphors mm. to try uh, to, to develop, you know, the, the fancy word for it is heuristics. Right. And the word heuristic comes from Eureka. Right. That's the idea that you have. It's sort of an epiphany. Um, and and I like there to be ways of looking at complex topics that are far more intuitive and in the realm of, you know, uh, cognitive linguistics in particular. There's this idea that there's like a, an understanding before language. Right. That when you're a child, you immediately develop a sense of sort of being inside of a boundary or outside of a boundary, you know, that, mm -hmm. and, and the sphere I found to be an extraordinarily um, uh, useful way of examining how people relate to the world. And so I, I ended up doing a dissertation on sort of this history um, of how conceptions of the sphere have really shaped understandings of reality. I was particularly looking at the sort of the West, uh, even though this is applicable everywhere, but I was looking at the ways in which the idea of the, the paradox of the sphere, you know, there's an ancient hermetic idea, like the, the universe is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere, right? And it kind of points to the ultimate, you know, not just relativity, but relationality of everything. Mm. Um, and the sphere, of course, uh, was very famously sort of the, the construction of Plato and Aristotle is like the universe is a sphere, earth is at the center. It's surrounded by all these crystal spheres that heaven mm. is far above. And then when that dissolved with the scientific revolution, it was like this major existential angst on the part of the European, collective European imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and using the sphere as a metaphor for understanding how all of those shifts in metaphorical understanding actually affect our you know, our comprehension, not just our comprehension, but our inaction in mm. the world at the deepest levels, you know? And so I, I, I really have loved playing with it and working with it. Mm. And it was a bit recursive because I was working in spherical projection environments mm -hmm. um, for relating a lot of these stories. And even today, the thing that, you know, I really sensed it for me was realizing that when you try to map and measure the observable universe, that ultimately 
you know, we're sort of back in this neo-geocentrism because the cosmic microwave background, when we measure it from here, it's a giant sphere all the way around us, right? Like we're inevitably at the center, which mm -hmm. cosmologists call the observational center, mm -hmm. but it's also, you know, not inconsequentially our ecological center, that we would not be here as observers if it weren't for all of these remarkable relationships that enable life, mm -hmm. right? So like you kind of crack, so for me, when I sort of started to crack open this metaphor, it revealed all kinds of interesting possibilities for all the way down spheres all the way down right yeah and and so i don't know it was just don, don was ki don was kind enough to be like yeah we'll call it sphere you know <laughs> uh, so that's 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 why mm -hmm. it's a great abstract <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you have anything to add to that no <laughs> great <laughs> it's all my fault um i mean so what i hear from you is that uh you know you were spitting out of corporate sustainability mm -hmm. and you know getting bored and cynical of <laughs> the work there, not to put words in your mouth. And um, and you were, you know, waking people up to the cosmology of place and bioregional consciousness through planetarium dome ex immersive experiences and visualizations and seeing the power in that, but also, you know, kind of like uh, just imagining you on tour and then like, you know, now what? Like, mm -hmm. On to the next place. And, and people didn't necessarily have uh, a roadmap or tools or the social processes to, to pick that work up. And I call it the post-epiphanic hangover. That, those, it was, stole the words right out of my right? mouth. I yeah, thought you were yeah. coming to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you create this container, this, this, this studio, mm -hmm. spherical, to, to express the work and, and to bring all these threads together. So mm -hmm. maybe we can dive in on the work you're doing in LA and mm -hmm. and because that just seems like it's alive and exciting and kind of brings all these threads. And, and, and just to say, you know, I, my perception of Spherical over the years, and we've, you know, just kind of crossed paths loosely at Bioneers and through our friends at River. And, but it's always been about like, oh, they do the most epic visualizations <laughs> and they have all these cool graphics and they're really smart. And like, that's kind of like how I've experienced it mm. from afar. Mm. Um, so I don't know what else that provokes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, if you, you can take that. us through what, what's happening in Los Angeles, Don, what is this project and, and how does it fit in? We had the great fortune of being connected to some folks um, working in Los Angeles, uh, and we work with a group called Accelerate Resilience Los Angeles, and uh, they're headed up by a guy called Andy Lipkus, who, who founded a group called Tree People. Um, and it's a little bit like, if you know, you know, he's a legend mm -hmm. um, in urban forestry, particularly on the West Coast. Um, and you know, he ran that organization for almost 50 years. Um, and over that, over those decades, really honed an understanding of the urban landscape and mm. looking at its um, at its canopy, looking at its heat, looking at its flooding, going way back many decades, mm. mm -hmm. because of the way that the that the land has been built up. And so the hydrology, like much of California, not just in urban areas, but hydrology is is very mm. <laughs> transformed and in some ways broken um, because of you know, a century plus of yeah. paving. Yeah. And um, and so Andy's insight years ago was over over time was that if you want to have a healthy urban canopy, if you want to have a healthy, um, cool, functioning ecology, mm. that you have to be looking at the health of the watershed. And again, many folks know this, but if you don't, um, LA County is drawing from three major kind of straws or, or what get referred to as aqueduct sheds by, uh, by some of our collaborators, where you've got water being pulled um, from multiple Western states, from the Colorado River, from what's now referred to as the Owens Valley, and coming down from the California Delta. So these huge straws pulling water into, uh, into urban LA. Mm. And yet the water, when it does come, is largely very quickly because that's what impervious services are and do is they ca catch the water, channel it, and send it out to the ocean as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And so there's this impression that the whole region is, is a desert mm -hmm. because it has in many ways been aridified and desertified because of human activity. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the history of it. Uh, the historical ecology is incredibly diverse and there are beautiful wetlands and, and fabulous function there. Um, but because of that, those years and years of, uh, of, of paving, all that human activity, that type of development, 
um, you end up with massive heat differentials. These are mm. patterns that you see in urban areas all around the world, but the heat island effect is very intense. And so in a lot of ways, when we look at the question of climate, right, and mm. we've talked, I mean, we've spent m much of our lives talking about, about climate um, at a planetary scale, mm. our focus is very much climate at, at a local regional scale because the, the heat differentials can be enormous. Right. You know, if you go onto a, into the a middle of, of one of the many schools, um, it can be 146 degrees Fahrenheit on, on the asphalt. Um, there are stories being written about kids getting burned on slides. I mean, it's, it's very intense. And so unwinding that work, uh, we were invited in to work with, uh, with Andy's new organization to develop tools to be able to assist in uh, communities being able to apply for public funds. Mm. Right now in Los Angeles in particular, one of the standout sources of funds is a, um, a bond measure was passed after, you can imagine, decades of work by some of Andy Lipkis's fellow travelers and himself, many, many years working to pass a, a bond measure that, uh, that unlocks somewhere between 280 and $300 million a year mm. as a tax on those paved and perfused surfaces. And so that funding is available for water infrastructure, for planting, for green infrastructure, for basically catching the water in the land when it comes mm -hmm. and holding it to feed the trees, to be able to cool the, the, the landscape, all the things that are fundamental to how do you heal any landscape in any context, urban or rural, is how do you really hold that water mm -hmm. when it comes and hold it in the soil, hold it underground, whatever you need to do. Uh, but in doing that in a place like LA is particularly challenging. Mm -hmm. So you can hear, like a lot of our focus is um, is on looking at these questions of of the local ecology and the essence in the bioregion. But we're having to also work within a, a a jurisdictional boundary of a county that has 88 cities, a place where the river has a different jurisdiction than all its tributaries, and that when you really want to be healing and cooling a place. It means actually having to work very closely mm. with the people in the in the um, the communities that have been most impacted. Right. So we've been building tools to help them easily visualize where they are, what are the qualities of that place, where does the water flow from, what does the heat look like, how what are the kinds of things the community want to see on a site in a place, and give them enough of a capacity to then be able to apply and tap into those millions of dollars in funds mm. that were intended to go to them in the first place. Mm. So we doing software development, a lot of community engagement um, and design really focused on hyper accessibility. Got it. So we paved over paradise and now we need to repair it. Mm. Folks like Andy have been, you know, just the early seeds of this work and mm -hmm. showing us the way. And, and I imagine this is beyond just tree planting and goes into you know, rethinking how we do irrigation and mm -hmm. water retention and um, aquifers in our cityscapes. But Absolutely. you're dealing with this complicated mess of multiple jurisdictions and different populations and groups that all have to coordinate. But here you've got this pool of a few hundred million dollars mm -hmm. that's earmarked for this. Yep. How do we actually bring that capital into the places and projects that need it and you are using visualization to unlock the coordination layer to help make that easier as well as the social processes that you that you referred to do i have that roughly correct i mean visualization is one part of it for sure you know mm -hmm. but a lot of it is a surprising amount of user research and interaction design mm. you know because the visualizations are useful. We've made a tool for visualizing water flows mm -hmm. on web-based maps, um, which have been remarkably well-received because you, when you see it, you realize you've never seen it before. I help at, steward a land project, and it never ceases to amaze me, that zero-to-one aha experience of just showing it on a map. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. like, oh, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, that's and, how it yeah. works. And, that's, cool. and that's, it, that is almost never temporal. Mm. Right, like you never see time-based phenomena on these static two right. D maps, right. and so we have a very static orientation, an object-oriented <laughs> orientation mm -hmm. um, to places, and to be able to see, you know, whether it's migration patterns or water flows or you know development over time, um, which a lot of people are seeing now with like time lapse. You can go on Google Earth, or, you know, see various phenomena, and mm -hmm. but most of the time it's in the context of like, oh my God, look at that city growing; it's cancerous, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you 
see what it looks like where water is coming from. We can click on an area and see the aqueducts that are being drained from Payahanadu, Owens Valley, and from the Delta and from the Colorado River Basin, all the way into the specific storm drain in LA County. Mm. And to be able to just uh, you know, intuitively grasp that upstream downstream effect. Because you can also click on a spot and see where it's draining to. Mm. So all of a sudden, you know, you have that much deeper intuitive understanding that so many, you know, uh, systems thinking advocates are, are constantly trying to relate in some meaningful way. Right. You know, but it's very difficult to understand nodal points and leverage points and all these things. And it's it's very very conceptual. And mm. so we use visualization sort of in service of being able to understand the systemic dynamics of those relationships. Mm. And there's a lot more to it, you know, that, that there's a lot of uh, need, especially with regards to open data, especially uh, that, that, that remarkable, like in LA County, it's one of the most studied places on earth. They have a very cool team of folks working on GIS and LIDAR and all kinds of, you know, mm. technical infrastructure that's made available. But it's like the final step to get into the hands of communities so that they can really access and understand what it means mm -hmm. requires investment. And so that's where we've realized like, and it's the same with NOAA, it's the same with EPA, the EPA, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency, that the, there's not much investment that goes into the real interaction design and, you know, to kind of use the pretty tired metaphor, you know, the last mile, right? Mm -hmm. That communities needing to access this stuff Mm -hmm. are not you know they're, they're not well versed in in using the particular platforms that most cities and municipalities are using and so we started to really inquire into what is that going to take starting off with using some gaming engines and some of the very high end stuff that's you know hollywood level of effects and and it was just too much, actually. Like, it, like we it would have required more bandwidth than we than most communities have access to. It would have required graphics processors they didn't have access to. So we ended up going with web-based platforms and defining the design parameters to really then start looking at like, well, what can we do within that? You know, that like you, a lot of people understand, you know, the nature and dynamics of SimCity, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, which is very accessible that most people can get to in some way, and uh, as with most gaming. Um, and on the other end, you know, there's the more complex modeling, simulation, engineering, analysis, mapping kind of tools that are usually meant for professionals. So we're doing something out of in between mm -hmm. where we want to bring the sensibility of gaming that a lot, that it, it encourages play, it encourages curiosity, it encourages questioning mm -hmm. to where you start doing something and it's not just you're doing it because you had to be trained in how to do it <laughs> or you had to like go through some Ooh. long process to yeah. understand the nature of what are watersheds, you know? It's like you actually learn through doing mm -hmm. and things that are happening are like really just in time. If you have a curiosity, you get to start following that path in whatever way. There's also a fallacy though, I think, in, in things needing to be ever more specific, always more photo real, always yep. more re right. real time, like that, that there's the value, there's a place for all these things. I mean, we've, we worked with them extensively, <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of the, a lot of the times it doesn't actually help. And if you try to give things, um, even an aesthetic quality that's too photo real, it provides, it almost says to the user that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. you're dealing with something that is a, a match, like the the ongoing fantasy of the digital twin. It, it rep, it's an exact representation of the of the physical world, mm. and that's not what's needed a lot of the time. That that when people are coming together and they're saying, "I want I want to see these things emerge and and happen on the landscape," um, sometimes it's actually a lot easier for them to make sense of just saying. Mm -hmm. I think we want a tree there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we want this. And that you start to give them a better sense, um, but not require them to, or even tell, you know, have, have their, their brains kind of go through a process where they think this tree is going to immediately sequester X amount of carbon and I'm going to put that on my little ledger over here. And then I'm going to, like, you know, that it all becomes this hyper quantifiable mm -hmm. model. Early stage design with community that's not helpful necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so the longer we, we work with folks and, and try things out, that's where the focus is. How do you, how can you really get people using something quickly mm -hmm. and being able to make sense of things very, very quickly without having to go through a massive training? Which right. is probably yeah. helpful to distinguish too, because in applying for grants, you know, especially right now, it's important to understand mm -hmm. with the inflation reduction act and all the infrastructure money coming in the U S mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a, a you know smaller version of that in the county, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but there's almost always a technical assistance grant that happens first. Mm. 
And that is you apply, you have a project idea, you apply for that grant, and then you get money to then hire uh, landscape architects and engineers and architects. And they will help to put the bounded conditions on the dreams of the project, right? And what we found was that it was just getting to the process of applying for technical assistance <laughs> that was itself very complicated. Mm. And so it was very hard for communities and non-specialists to really engage in that. Yeah. And it took a lot of work for mm. them. And that's why they, they, in LA, they just weren't applying. It was almost all the professional firms, the municipalities. Exactly. And so, you know, and, and I think that's, that's roughly applicable probably to a lot of grant processes and yeah. programs, right? That you can bring in the professionals, but if you're just in a visioning process mm. and you're just like blue sky in it, you want to have tools that can at least give you some bounded conditions and parameters to be like, well, what's it do if I play with this? What happens if I like connect the bias whale to the tree? So the tree mm. has water, like, because it, it, the, the relationships are everything. And if you change the dynamics of the relationships, it changes the nature of what it is that you're going to be quantifying. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very different mentality than trying to get, you know, engineering grade, you know, modeling and simulation about things so that you can at least just play around with stuff yeah. and then check those later. But like in the process of working with communities, like you really want it to be something that people can be like, oh, that's cool. I, I want to play around. You know, like mm. our, our, our 10, almost 11 year old, like she's our beta tester. <laughs> it's like <laughs> if she can get it like and, and she finds all kinds of holes in the logic, you know, that sometimes there are perverse incentives. If you do a point system that's like rewarding you for certain things and you can go mm. in certain directions that get really extreme, mm -hmm. you know, that being able to really understand the dynamics of play and how that is enticing. Um, is extremely important for getting people into these, like, you know, kind of very technical arenas of of design. Mm. Can you say more about the the implicit or embedded philosophy? I mean, it sounds like you're kind of democratizing the grants process a bit more. You know, you're enabling wider access than just the engineering professionals that might have had the, the skill set to use some of these fancy tools. And it's like, hey, come play, come vision. Yeah, can you share more about like what's driving you towards that aim? I think it's the it's the goal of um, well, it's like our I think our shared motivation. I think we share the motivation with with Accelerate Resilience Los Angeles. I think the the source of the funds for these projects is intended to be in support of community. A lot of the time you see um, going on right now, I mean, a lot of funding is increasingly wonderfully being directed at um, at places that have been historically disadvantaged and they have mm -hmm. different, there's different designations for what that means. But a lot of the time, these are, these are communities that have historically been um, disinvested from, potentially redlined, um, but the mm. effect of many, many years of, of that is, um, is just a lack of green infrastructure, cooling, any kind of amenities. And so correcting for that is in a lot of ways embedded into the intention mm. of a lot of funders and a lot of funding streams. Um, it just brings up other challenges. But right. that's, that is kind of, in, in so many ways, is the intention. And I mean, there's a really important aspect of it that Andy consistently brings up, and that's mm. if people don't care about it, it will die. And it being like the project, the tree, the, like whatever the thing is that's being built. If you're just like, oh, you know, the government's going to come and take care of the tree for me for the next 30 years. Like mm -hmm. he would hold entire, you know, uh, ceremonies right. with communities where they would like take their hair and plant it in the tree so that it's being entangled with the DNA of the tree mm. so that it like becomes their family tree, which, you know, mm. also mirrors a lot of other practices mm. of indigenous communities <laughs> around the world, right? So he was in, in his own way, like discovering the necessity of having that relational dynamic. And it's very hard to get people interested in a lot of these things if there's just such a high barrier to entry that you can't totally. even, you know, comprehend, you know, why are these things happening in particular ways? So it's, it's, it's that, it's the accessibility, which I think is kind of the, you know, the, mm. the foundation, mm -hmm. but it's also a higher order need, mm. it's even on the part of the engineers and the, the municipalities we're talking to, right. they want there to be co-learning and there's the need on the part of the, the communities to hear the engineers and the agencies, what they want, what mm -hmm. they need, and mm -hmm. to take the time to really do that. And they're, you know, they're defined engagement processes and they have a window to do that and they go out and they do their thing. But, you know, it, it, like, how do you do that in an ongoing way, mm -hmm. right? And how do you really gain the trust of communities to show that you're not just going to exploit what they're doing out of bad faith because you find out some information? I mean, there are really complex questions that come up in all of this. 
And on the flip side, the engineers, they really want, like in, the, in our case, the community is to understand, like, where's the water coming from? Where is it going? Why does it matter if you capture it? You know, the, mm -hmm. there's what watershed are you in? There's just like really foundational stuff that most of us in the course of our daily lives will not encounter that. And it's right. really hard to find out by going to government servers and trying to like just find, I mean, fortunately with in LA, it's getting easier and easier because there's funding to actually support educational materials for doing some of these things. Mm. And they've hired watershed coordinators for every main watershed to go out and engage the communities. And, you know, and that's, so they've definitely got a leg up in that regard. Um, but most places like in Oakland, you know, we don't have anything like that. And you try to find out what watershed you're in and, you know, good luck. <laughs> like you might find some old pamphlet from the local totally. museum from 20 years ago, you know. And so it's like how to make these types of, mm. um, you know, understandings and contexts more accessible so that they become part of the lingua franca of the community, you know. And I think that's what a lot of the enthusiasm around bioregionalism and stuff is like, how do you do that, right? But it really needs to start, I think, in many ways with where there's motivation. Mm -hmm. And if we can transform the grant application process to be such that it's also a co-learning process, mm -hmm. then everybody ends up evolving their own thinking and their own understanding, right? That becomes a truly developmental process as opposed to just being like, okay, we're going to go make our obligatory website to tell people the things they want to know and or the community just being like frustrated because the stupid bureaucrats, you know, aren't listening. Like how to find reconciling forces within all of that so that it's almost like so seamless that it's just obvious, you know, that you see more like once you see it, you, you can't unsee it. And you're like, why haven't we been doing that the whole time? But honestly, because it just hasn't been a priority. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you did work around like regenesis and kind of examining some of that social process. Um, I'm curious how that's now informing the work and in, in this kind of last mile, not just the visualization tooling, but mm -hmm. yeah, what are you learning and what are those interventions, socially speaking? Mm -hmm. um, it's a timely question. I just got back from LA yesterday, <laughs> um, did a full day workshop with a fellowship it's like a climate resilience leadership network fellowship um, that, that the Accelerate Resilience LA is helping to do with a, a leadership group called Coro, uh, which are a number of folks from different agencies and utilities and nonprofits in the LA basin. Um, and we did a full day workshop around the LA basin as a living system. And we spent most of the day looking at the ways in which the hydrological, the geological, the anthropological histories demonstrate, I mean, uh, for me, kind of like unquestionably, mm. that when you look at the basin as a living entity, that you begin to understand why the hubris of sort of human-centric, anthropocentric totally. design is absolutely doomed to failure. Yeah. And we're seeing all those breaking points right now. Broadly, we call it climate change, you yeah. know, but yeah. like, but like that um, understanding of places as, as being alive um, is absolutely foundational to, you know, cultures throughout history and, you know, you know being of a place, literally the meaning of the word indigenous mm. means to relate to that. And I know from, you know, so much of your work, you're deeply familiar with a lot of the work that's going on in Aotearoa and all the work with rights of nature. And, you know, th and there's a reason for that because it, it dissolves this boundary between just human use mm. and the use of all of the, you know, enmeshed, entangled, you know, webs of relations that are necessary for us to even exist. Mm -hmm. And so we were presenting sort of our, our, our field kit in that context to really look at, you know, what has been this deep history of this place. Why is LA what it is? Why is the basin made of what it's made of? And it's all these river deposits and the high mountains collect all the atmospheric mm -hmm. river rain that's coming over. And it's, you know, and there's, there's a very specific dynamic to this place that makes it what it is. And the human activity that's there is patterned after that activity, right? That, that there is no su such thing as a tabula rasa, you know, terra nullius substrate of a place where humans mm. just come in and do their thing. You know, mm -hmm. the world is not flat, right? And so when you really spend the time to get to know a place, you can start acting much more deeply in reciprocity with that place. And so, you know, as, as kind of insane as it sounds, we're trying to 
think about how to do that in the LA basin with people that have never necessarily, some have, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are like many, many indigenous groups doing amazing work to relate this stuff. And it's actually one of the most impressive things about this work is how clear those communities have been mm -hmm. around relationships to water, around relationships to land. Um, there's a really remarkable documentary called The Aqueduct Between Us, which I really encourage people to go watch. It's like a five-part thing on YouTube. It's very, very cool. The director, Annie Mendoza, really tells the story of like what happens when you create these straws that suck the water from these other places and you create these water colonies that are still active today mm -hmm. and draining Mono Lake and doing all these things that that hubris of colonial infrastructure is what's creating the danger, right? And the, the degree to which we are attempting to weave this in with language that people can relate to and kind of, you know, within the, or, you know, the context of modernity um, is an experiment. We're seeing like, how can this happen? Like, what, what, is it, what would it take so that people aren't just like, oh yeah, that's some woo woo thing and they want to think the river's alive. It's like, no, actually the river's literally alive. And, and if you start to listen and pay attention and relate to all of these other beings in a different way, mm -hmm. then we start to really understand that, you know, what a fool's errand it is just to think that like, as long as we get the solar panels, the windmills and draw down the carbon, that everything's going to be okay. Because mm -hmm. it won't, you know, we're right. just going to continue a lot of the same processes of extraction. But if you're in relationship in a different way, mm. then it starts to point to some other ways of, you know, hospicing as, as you know, Vanessa Andriotti talks about, like hospicing modernity, right? Like how do you put it, to, put it to bed in a good way so that we can evolve, you know, what needs to be happening? Mm -hmm. and, and I say it sounds insane because it's just like the, the scale of all of this is so... You yeah. know, like, how could you ever be commensurate yeah. mm. with, like, like, you go outside, you're like, really? Come on. Mm. But, you know, but what else is there to do, right? Like, so, exactly. So it's like, so it's paradoxical, but we're really trying to understand how to use these living systems frameworks, how to use these re regenerative processes, for lack of a better term, you know, living systems thinking in, in, in ways within these urban environments. A lot of the, you know, the, the way that, that, that we're doing that and who you were running those courses with in, um, in L.A., that's all, you know, in collaboration with Regenesis and certainly under their mentorship over the years. Yeah. So, um, mm. yeah, I mean, that running that with Regenesis. Yeah, yeah, they were there ago. with us. Yeah, so yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really trying to, to benefit from their many decades mm. of work. I mean, I think that every, in every case, every time, every time we work on anything, it's kind of based on like, okay, <laughs> we're, what is the, what is the deep history of all the work that's already been done on mm -hmm. this that got us to this point? Right. And who, how do we work with those folks? I think the other the, the other thing I, I'll, I'll just note that I think just in the context of technology development mm. um, is that when you look at the uniqueness of any place, that oftentimes uh, technology is, is, is rarely, well, it's rarely developed because it's rarely funded to be developed in such a way that it's hyper-local. Mm. Right. That generally, if you work at a big company, right. the focus is on how do you get this localized into as many countries as possible. So if you're going to say, OK, we're going to make green building technology or whatever, you end up having to really focus on metrics of numbers of things that are that you can generalize everywhere. So therefore, we all focus on measuring carbon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so to be able to kind of go the other direction and go and actually start entirely locally with local users and local ecological data and then work the other way down the line to say, well, what of this could we take to another place, another city? That's a different question. But we are first generating even the technology platform, the data uh, curation from the lens of what's going to work because of the essence of the place we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, we, we building these very homogenous tools to scale to the for-profit capitalist incentives that underpin these developmental cycles mm -hmm. and by starting in our local watershed literally yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, it results in a different a different configuration yeah and different different instruments of funding result mm -hmm. in a different configuration i mean if we mm -hmm. were taking vc capital or had done this in the lens of that then we would be having to think about all the time how what's the transition we're going to make from making something hyper accessible and usable and free mm -hmm. and open source for these people and turn it into something that's going to make our investors 10 to 100x back, right? There's some implicit rug pull there that we would be embedding into the core because of the type of, in, of the instrument of finance. Yeah. And so those questions, I think, come up a lot. It's like, how yeah. do we take what we're, what we're creating 
and have it sustain itself in other places and how can aspects of it be built upon uh, without finding ourselves in those those traps. Mm. We were talking about that this morning. It's like, you know, talk about the last mile, right? If that's the interaction design, if that's the accessibility, like, sure, everybody gets access to, you know, Google Drive, right? Mm. Because there's such an intense profit motive, they'll invest in how to make that happen, right? Mm. Same with the gaming industry. There's so much money involved, right? right? And when you look at the realm of civic technology, when you look at a lot of the open source tools, like there's just not the investment that goes into the accessibility and usability. So it stays pretty, you know, technologically elite mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, you know, mm -hmm. unless you get like a red hat and they put a front end on Linux and they try to make it easy to, you know, like that does happen, but that's just very much what we're noticing with regards to the motivations, even of a lot of the mapping platforms, you know, they're like, okay, we're going to go for that rideshare dollar, you know, and so everything starts to go towards transportation, right? Mm. And so we're really trying to invest in, at least within that realm, like how to create better interfaces for these extraordinarily important stories, interactions, data layers, so that those stories can be told in more powerful ways. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes they're just, they're, they're ignored, you know, if, at least in the context of the discourse around climate change or something, right? That mm -hmm. that everybody thinks they kind of understand what climate change is. So therefore we're just going out and we're doing these things. We're going to have that technical fix and gonna, that's going to be fine. Right. But I was really deeply influenced by Amitav Ghosh's book, um, The Nutmeg's Curse. Have you read this? Mm, no. Um, it goes through the history of sort of the extraction and the 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 uh, attempted you know annihilation of uh, indigenous cultures around the world, and points to the the literal connection that you have to a place, to the relationality that you have to a place, being the only thing that's commensurate with the scale of the destruction that's happening on the planet right now. Mm. That could that could actually like rise <laughs> rise to that right, mm. and when you, when I started to see a lot of this work in that context, right. like you really start to understand land back. You start to understand why mm. it's so important for cultures that are like really working on the continuity of the connection that they have to their places, right? And, and it's mm. far beyond just like, you know, this is my land, stay away. It's like no, actually, it's about the health and vitality of those places. It's way beyond just an anthropocentric view of it, you know, mm. and that aspect of understanding climate i think is like so poorly acknowledged a lot of the time in a lot of the climate you know discourse that that the more we can bring forth like that care that love that connection that relationality and for a lot of us that are homeless and we're not like in the you know the lands of our indigenous ancestors from however long ago it was that they were from a particular place i mean that that can be really confusing. It can actually be kind of like, you know, existential angst in some ways. But I do think that there's a responsibility and a, and a, and a kind of um, accountability that we can have to the places where we are to be open and humble to like, well, how could we be in service of the livingness of this place, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that, that driving a lot of what we're trying to do with the tools, not in a direct way. I mean, because can, that can also sound really preachy. It can sound really, mm -hmm. you know, kind of self-righteous or dogmatic, but like, that's not the point. The point is like, how do you evoke the care? How do you re-enchant what a place is, what the livingness is in a way that can really help to develop the capacity for that care? Mm. Is that what you mean by ontological repair? I see on your website, this is one of the services you offer. <laughs> yeah, that's what we mean by that. It, totally. <laughs> it I mean, is. I mean, it is because it's like to, to understand that it's this isn't a matter of in the Western mind, we tend to think in terms of like, oh, it's either human centric or nature centric, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the binary, right? We've got a big problem with binary logic in the Western culture. And what, what you know, a number of indigenous scholars have pointed out is that a lot of those cultures are, are what, what um, has been called kin centric, you know, like relationships are at the center. And when you use the term ontology in the context of philosophy, not just in terms of like a computer database, but like it means what you think is, what exists. And the idea that what exists is primarily in service of humans or in service of, you know, the other, of service of nature, you're going to arrive oftentimes at like, you know, equally devastatingly <laughs> depressing kind of <laughs> conclusions, my experience. Um, but if you see what exists as primarily relationships, 
I mean, that kind of does change everything, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so when we say ontological repair, we're actually referring to like, okay, this is a, you know, a, a pretty toxic way of going through the world of thinking that everything is just in service of humans or that humans are a cancer and a plague upon the earth and have no role to play within the web of life, right? We've been the, meaning to get the ontological repair, like the uh, like the plumbing service, like we do yeah. ontological repair, put it on the back of the truck. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 <laughs> One of these days. Yeah. And I mean, you're both so immersed in this world of technology and in the Bay Area and on the cutting edge of all these tools, and then you're also kind of meshed in these kinds of conversations about ontological repair and relationships and concentric and like, yeah. How do you reconcile that? What do you see as like the limits of technology in this in this moment in time we're in of just rapid acceleration and advancement, so to speak? Try not to be hype people. <laughs> just like try things. See, what do you see, mean? What do you mean by that? I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for anything. For mm. anything, if there's money to be made, you're going to find enthusiasts um, talking about it in very. I have this token to ways. sell you. No. I love that. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm I'm willing to take a look at it, but um, but I'm not necessarily going to get a fully buy into your sales pitch. I think there's a lot of that. A lot of uh, well, it's maybe a side point, but I kind of feel like a lot of American culture is embedded with sales language. Totally right, and so you kind of encounter that a great deal. Here you, ha- you encounter mm. that in technology and uh, mm. and sort of the entanglement of of technology that's been funded either by corporations or or uh, big VC and so yeah we're we are bombarded by that stuff and that hype all the time um, but we've also been doing the work for long enough to kind of be like okay yeah sure let's talk about mm-hmm. generative design or generative AI or whatever we or you know you've got pictures of you wearing VR headsets in the 80s I mean we've been working in these things for well, a long the 90s. The, <laughs> Look quite the sad 60s. old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 1880s. <laughs> the 1880s. He's yeah. Um, but, that we've been working with these technologies for for long enough that they don't kind of come out of nowhere. Right. We've seen their their mm. precedents. We've seen the hype cycles come and go. Um, so I think we know a little bit now to just lo- just watch. See, let, let me see how that thing turns out. I'm curious. Mm. Uh, sometimes we try stuff. You know, as David said, we got very into gaming engines. We've worked with the with the VR headsets. We've worked in in all these dynamics, but not every tool, not every technology is the right thing. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I think that that's maybe my first point is just that, like, yes, we are here, and yeah. that means that we are adjacent to a particular narrative ecosystem, enthusiasm, um, and we're always having mm-hmm. to contend with that to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but never buy the sales pitch right away. The first thing I tried to do with GPT-3 was to ontologically repair it. And so I had a a very long conversation about its own ontological orientations, right? And I say that loosely because it obviously doesn't have any. It's it's what its training data is. It's the way that it's Mm -hmm. been... And it would, and, it, and, and in the dialogue, it, it, it refu- in the chat, it refused to acknowledge it was part of nature because it was made by humans, right? And so putting aside the complexities of the term nature, it was just, it was a fascinating exchange because you start to see the degree to which assumptions are embedded within like in the context of language models like it's and, and there's so many brilliant people that have been pointing this out for a long time mm. but you start to see all the assumptions that are embedded in these technologies right mm-hmm. so the, the even the, the premise that technology is neutral or whatever is just laughable mm. because the way that they all come into being like their funding like how they're being applied i mean all of these things it's always infused with assumptions and paradigms whether or not the people creating the technology see their own assumptions and paradigms is another story, right? Mm-hmm. But the language models are a particularly like rich use case because you can just inquire directly, right? To see how it is that it its training has led to its like fill in the blank responses of a language model to give you whatever that, you know, that s- summed response of all of its training is, is to give you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I think in the context of looking at the utility of a lot of these um, types of tools, you know, it's, it's been in some ways like exciting to see how computation can be applied towards addressing a lot of complexities. I mean, we're building tools that people could find out like Mm -hmm. certain things much easier if they can be guided through processes. It's like, it's, it's amazing. On the other hand, 
the hype men are out there promising that it does everything and in the process consuming vast amounts of energy, time, resources, human labor in the most abusive, extractive possible ways mm -hmm. so that the potential of what the technology can actually do is right. often just going to be completely overshadowed and ignored because of the desire to extract and accumulate as much capital mm -hmm. from those technologies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do about that? I don't know. But, like, how it is we're trying to understand, like, okay, how do we take this one little subset so that we could make good on all of the destruction that's been done to make it possible to use these tools, mm -hmm. right? And in, in, in those processes, we try to stay open and not, you know, we could be completely shunning of all of that. And I think it's a totally viable thing to do. And lots of people mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. but we're really trying to understand, like, are there some ways in which these tools can be applied in service of the, the broader, you know, kind of realization of systemic health? Mm -hmm. And it's just super depressing most of the time because, like, as soon as something, like, has that little glimmer of, like, wow, that would be really great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just, like, the hammer of just, like, hype comes in. And mm -hmm. you're like, no, like, it doesn't, you don't need to say that. It doesn't need to, like, do the everything. Right. And it's especially, like, telling right now because mm -hmm. in the context of so-called AI, you know, which is neither artificial nor intelligent, like, the, it, it's exposing the degree to which the deep histories of where these technologies came from are being ignored. I mean, that's another sub totally. of our research, you know, totally. that like a lot of this came out of early cybernetics research, which was mm. deeply connected to the understanding of different kinds of kinds of cognition and forms of, you know, what's called, what's called autopoiesis or the, the, the you know, the act of self-creation that, and there, there were many subcultures and extraordinary, you know, research agendas and, and explorations going on decades ago mm. that now all of that is all but kind of forgotten. And it's all kind of seen in the context of like computational cognition mm -hmm. that, oh, of course, intelligence is just a machine, right? Like, like we could just recreate, you know, human cognition if we just had enough processing power, which is a hilariously kind of anachronistic way of understanding cognition like mm. that was like back that was back in the 60s right mm. and so there's this incredibly naive philosophy around the nature of intelligence that's driving a lot of this because it's these hype men and they mostly are men that are like driving these ideas right mm -hmm. and 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 i think ultimately to the danger of everyone because if we are to make as well, there was a great essay published a few years ago called making kin with the machines you know like if we're to make kin with these like emergent forms of cognition on the planet, it's really important to understand like this isn't just a, like we're not just replacing humans. We're not just like replicating our own, you know, computers inside of our heads, mm -hmm. that there's a lot more that they could potentially be offering of how like we're co-evolving with all the other life on the planet. I mean, and so mm. much of the, like the limits of technology when we look at urban context or urban design have to do with, this ongoing fantasy that I think is perpetuated by certainly technology companies and um, and you know even sometimes folks who are working um, to get things built that there could be some kind of magical cybernetic tool that would that would give them all the answers mm -hmm. and what happens with that <laughs> um, and really the limit is actually that you don't because if you don't have um, space for not just dialogues with the kind of community members that we're working with, but even really spending time with the people who can kind of creatively think about recombinations of, of how do you bring systems together. There is no, there is no magical green machine that's going to, that's going to design the world that you always have human systems, even if those human systems show up as bureaucracies, mm -hmm. even if they show up as boards of supervisors, they're still human systems. What, what are they understanding? What are they prioritizing? And the technology is just there, you know, as an enabler to people making decisions. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it gets it gets lost, um, but we see that a lot. You know, like we're gonna mm -hmm. have the magic the magic tool that does whatever, and and the the relational experiential piece of of the work is is often what what gets lost when we overemphasize the technology. We kind of look at it all the time, like what's the piece of this that we can. Uh, that we can do, but the work that we're doing in LA, we, you know, while we are indeed making a product and it, there is a software at the core of that, it's inside programs, it's inside actual engagement. Which yeah. is the other 
reason for spherical. It's like inher- inherently kind of like omnidisciplinary, mm. transdisciplinary, you know, that in order to even address a lot of these things, it's really important to be able to have fluid boundaries in terms of where you're inquiring, you know, like what it is that you're trying to, to see or to do. Because oftentimes, you know, we encounter so frequently, it's, you asked about being here in the Bay Area, mm. you know, there's decades and decades of scholars in a, uh, from a field called science and technology studies <laughs> that have been critiquing these things endlessly, mm. you know, in terms of like the, just the incredibly naive assumption of the capacity to quantify everything, the capacity to achieve some ultimate objectivity, to have this God's eye view from nowhere, giving you this kind of platonic ideal view mm-hmm. where you're ultimately going to like figure it all out and be able to calculate everything so that, you know, mm-hmm. all phenomena are somehow able to squeeze into a computer, right? And if you look at it, like that's kind of at the heart of a lot of what's going on right now, whether it's finance or whether it's like, oh, AI for earth, you know, we're going to like, AI is going to help us solve climate change, which I've heard, you know, (laughs) with increasing frequency over the justifications of why it is we need to go out and extract all of the metal on the bottom of the oceans to be able to fund all the AI, right? Right. So it's like this recursive loop that's actually based on a fallacy. Mm -hmm. And that's that the world is ultimately quantifiable and calculable. Mm-hmm. In a way that doesn't have bad faith actors, <laughs> that that even if you give if if you grant them, yeah, sure, the world's going to be quantifiable and calculable, but then that's assuming that somebody wouldn't just use that totally. to like be as extractive as possible, right? So it's like multiple nested layers mm. of a kind of um, terrible arguments, um, and so the degree to which I think it's important to be informed by a lot of these histories and these critiques. You know, is it, it, I mean, it, you, you can't, I, I can't understate, or excuse me, I can't overstate how important that is, mm-hmm. because a lot of the people that are making these arguments now are largely being ignored, um, especially in the AI realm mm-hmm. of like, you know, this kind of catastrophizing of AI becoming this uber consciousness that's going to, you know, ignoring, of course, like, well, all the reasons that it's killing a lot of people right now is very human motivations for, like, accelerating extractive and murderous processes, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, forget the, like, you know, HAL 9000 over the horizon, right? We mm. we actually have a lot more to worry about, like, now, immediately, and well into the future with regards to how these tools are being applied. But it's like a, um, you know, it's it's a it's a fig leaf that's put up or, or an Oz curtain, that's put over the real motivations to how these things are being applied. So the, so the discourse and the kind of the naivete within that discourse have, have remained pretty astonishing, especially the degree to which it like goes unquestioned within popular media. And, you know, in groups like D.A.R.E. and others, the Distributed AI Research Institute, like they are doing really, really regular, amazing critiques of this stuff. And, and I think for us, it would be like really nice to see a lot of that you know, more foregrounded, especially when it comes to using these types of tools for indigenous communities and language revitalization and data sovereignty. And there's so many cool things going on, Mm -hmm. but they really aren't receiving the, you know, much, you know, funding or support or attention. Mm. And that's where I think the technology side of things like could be incredibly useful. Mm. One of the things that I uh, think about also in a lot of what you were just saying is that we've spent you know, a bunch of years now running a project uh, called Gaian Systems that, you know, David, you can tell tell us more about, but looking at uh, planetary ecology and how to understand it, that, mm. that, you know, as David said at the outset, that a lot of what we've done at Spherical has been, you know, creating projects where we felt like there was a gulf or there was some missing thing, some missing core understanding. You know, for instance, you, we want to understand what regenerative projects are. We don't know. We don't want to def- define it. Here are 350 of them on videos, and you can look at them, and then maybe you'll see the patterns. Mm. And one of those projects was looking at at the world of Gaia theory and the history of Gaia theory, uh, which is tied into some of the history of cybernetics that David mentioned. But it was one of the aspects that I think we both encountered in working in the technology world, but also adjacent to it, is that even now— that you've got a lot of people who are holding a model of the world that is that is computational and mechanistic, right? mm-hmm. and they're very 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 smart. You know, I've worked for many many like literal PhD rocket scientist, computer scientist folks, but they've got a mechanistic model they're operating from, which means that their understanding of how planetary systems work is uh, is limited to these kinds of fairly simple exchanges. And so when they wake up to the topics at hand around climate change, they default to a mechanistic idea about carbon, movement of carbon, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it feels very comfortable because they can kind of go, okay, we can see how this, how this mechanism is at work without really looking at how um, many, many complex processes on the, on the planet are working together, including water cycles, to cool, uh, cool places and cool the planet in significant ways. And so the science that they are paying attention to is uh, true but narrow. Mm. And it influences so much of technology uh, development, investment, uh, narrative, and we, we see that across the board. Um, mm-hmm. the, the world of climate tech as it sort of come up uh, is very influenced by these mental models. And so I think that the the question, you know, and the question we started asking um, in collaboration with uh, with Dr. Bruce Clark uh, at Texas Tech University, who's spent many, many years writing about these things, was how to help reveal and uh, and run workshops in San Francisco around Gaian processes. If you want to speak to that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a project really seeded uh, around a decade ago when I saw Bruce Bruno Clark, as he goes by, um, give a talk about whatever happened to AI. And it was hilarious at the time because it was before all the new cycle. Yeah. And, and he was talking about it in the context of like machine cognition and planetary cognition. And machines, as we know them, are emergent properties of the lithosphere and the hydrosphere and the atmosphere and all of the biosphere and us putting them together as humans. And, you know, mm-hmm. and seeing all of that as part of the planetary cognition, which for me was like, whoa, <laughs> that's a really nice thought. Like, mm-hmm. that's really an interesting way into it because it's not othering right. that, that form of cognition, right? And so we began sort of scheming on um, how to create different types of, he ended up writing a book about it called Gaian Systems, but in the project we've been doing these workshops and have did a um, installation at the gray area here in San Francisco called The End of You with a bunch of artists a number of years ago, inviting people into thinking about these forms of planetary cognition. What does it mean to think like a living planet? Mm. You know, and, and our friend Joshua says, what does it mean to live like a thinking planet? You know? <laughs> like, um, and the Gaian systems view is really one of understanding the planet as fundamentally symbiotic as a lot of the, and a lot of this comes out of people are familiar with Lo, uh, James Lovelock for the most part as the inventor of Gaia theory, but he had a collaborator, Lynn Margulis, who, you know, really overturned a lot of assumptions at the heart of Darwinian evolution, particularly since Darwin didn't have a lot to say about the origin of species. She looked at the origin of species as, an, as a microbiologist mm-hmm. and really brought to the fore this notion that species in their origins oftentimes are symbiotic. They come together. So it fundamentally overturns this idea of, you know, survival of the fittest as being in competition as being the primary or only, Mm -hmm. you know, like driver of evolution. And this, this notion of endosymbiosis was incredibly powerful because it's resulted in this whole field of uh, called reticulate evolution, which is basically like we're all deeply interconnected, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and of course, like the usual ways that we think about, but like even at the, you know, the biological level. And Gaian, Gaian systems are these nested systems of a planet that, you know, are constantly working in mysterious ways, right? We're, we're starting to see a lot of this. Even NASA's making visualizations now called the living planet, right? Whereas Gaia theory at one point, people, I think they thought it was like, oh, it's just this spiritual thing and mm. people buy into it. And it's, well, that was because they used the metaphor of Gaia, right? But mm. uh, if you, the Greek goddess, but if you really look into the science and particularly from the, the Lynn Margulis's perspective, it has incredible implications for how we're thinking about climate and our response to a lot of the real and present dangers in our world, which has a lot to do with, as Don mentioned, the hydrological cycle, for instance, not being taken into account in a number of the climate, global climate models, because it's just too complex. So they're just like, oh, we'll just leave that out. Right. But anybody knows that if you are in a place and you capture the water and it brings forth life, it cools down the atmosphere, right? Mm. And so that within a microclimate and the global climate's an aggregate of microclimates. Mm -hmm. So that just as that simple example, understanding how life creates, as Janine Binya says, like life creates the conditions for life, right? Mm. That if to understand these issues through that lens of life, through that lens of living systems, you arrive at radically different conclusions about what's possible, what's the potential, what needs to be done, 
But if you look at, if you're looking at it all through this kind of mechanistic view, mm-hmm. then it becomes something where the inevitable conclusion is like, well, obviously we have to build rocket ships and go to Mars and start over there because this whole thing is screwed. You know, I mean, like or that. Even that you just need to cover the desert and solar panels and things will be solved. That, that, right. That you right. Can, there's right. some right. kind yeah. of technological hardware that you can apply. Yeah. Well, the geoengineering. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, yeah. Totally logical. Right. Because yeah. it's just a machine. Yeah. But. You know, so it depends. The, the, the seated conditions and the root assumptions, the paradigm mm-hmm. that you're coming from, have everything to do with what your conclusions for action in the world are going to be. So that's why we started this project. It's still ongoing. We are really excited about trying to <laughs> keep moving on some educational materials with this so that people can take a good, long, hard look at a lot of what was being written back in the 70s and the 60s and, and beyond, you know, and even more recently with. Linda's foreign meetings and, and the Coevolution Quarterly and like and a lot of these collaborations that were going on that reveal a different history and potential for computing cognition mm. for understanding these living systems in a way that helped to reveal, back to the visualization, helped to reveal the dynamics and the metabolisms and the processes that could help you know, us to think about the earth in a very different way and, and particularly about our places in a very different way. Hmm. Dave and Don, thank you so much. Any final words or reflections you want to end on? I, mean, I have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got but, yeah. 50 seconds. 50 yeah. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you have questions on camera or off camera? Uh, I, I'll take them on camera. All right. That'd be great. It. Let's get it. So like you're doing a whole series around, you know, what is it? The, the regeneration will be financed, right? What is funded? Yes. Re- be funded. What does that mean to you? I think it's a, an aspirational frame. I, it's hard for me to imagine uh, positive scenarios from here over the next, call it 10 to 20 years that don't, you know, radically embrace and evolve our current forms of money Mm. i don't think we're going to just like massively coordinate as a globe and do the work that we need to do completely outside of the monetary system but i don't think that the current economic structure and logic and design really is compatible with what we need to do either so it's kind of like a fierce commitment to okay well what are those innovations what are those evolutions that are taking place and I'm a bit contrarian in a lot of circles, some circles not so much, but I, I think one of the biggest games in town is this, this phenomenon of crypto and Web3 and on-chain and everything else because it, it gets at so much of the root of capital itself. Like we can now democratize monetary design, like monetary policy design through these new tokenized representations in peer-to-peer coordination systems that at least just gives us new surface area and new tools to play with so it's not to say you know writ large like crypto is mostly just like casino gambling behavior not a lot of impressive stuff that's come out you know in terms of real world application but i get excited about okay cool those tools are coming online at a moment in time where we really need to fundamentally change our financial architecture Mm. and haven't seen in the last call it five years as much conversation about the convergence between what's happening in kind of this regenerative ecologically minded space and what's happening in this kind of techno web three crypto space. Mm. And so, yeah, putting my hat in the ring a little bit of like, let's bring some of these conversations together and find some of those overlaps and start doing some experiments. Because what, thank you for that. I mean, because what, what it brings to mind is a lot of the same things we encounter, which is bad faith actors. Mm. Right. And it's the same with any kind of quantification of carbon credits and, totally. you know, like all of these issues that regardless of the technology and how promising the technology is, that there's always like, how's it being gamed? And you're referring to it as the casino, right? Yeah. Literally being gamed. Yeah. And I think that's something that we're constantly you know, encountering mm. and thinking even for what we're making, like, okay, how's a bad faith actor going to mm-hmm. take this and just like use it to exploit the community, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things that I think we would love to see more of a dialogue around when it comes to a lot of these technologies mm-hmm. is that what is, what are the, not only what are the potentials, but how have they been used by bad faith actors and mm-hmm. what are the systems in place for being able to even understand what those techniques are? You know, as opposed to the enthusiasm, mm-hmm. I think that 
gr grinds on us so much mm -hmm. when it comes to all these different types of technology is the degree to which that is just ignored some summarily usually mm -hmm. as like the thing that no matter how amazing language models might be, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're, they're being abused in all of these ways. And having that woven into the conversation, mm -hmm. I think is actually one of the most um, honest ways of, of attempting to ensure some pathway of integrity of how the, the tools can be used. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you're giving me some good threads to think on because I, I feel like I... I can rattle off a lot of critiques of AI and of blockchains as two examples, and you know, can also talk about synthetic bio, and you know, just and yet, um, yeah, like I, it's kind of interesting because you know, I left Silicon Valley. I, like I joke, Silicon Valley radicalized me. You know, mm -hmm. I left Silicon Valley for a farm in New Zealand. Like mm -hmm. that's how radicalized I became. Um, and yet, you know, I also operate in a lot of spaces where I feel like there's not a lot of appreciation for the transformational potential of a lot of these tools and technologies. Mm. And so it's kind of like, you know, pointing at like, hey, look, like 8 billion of us, like really big problems at hand, like let's actually embrace some of these things because they can be on ramps into completely new patterns of institutional forms. And, you know, it's like Bucky's old quote of like, you know, if you want to change how a person thinks, don't don't try it that way. You give them a tool where mm -hmm. the use of that tool changes how they think. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing, but you know, I do think that that's interesting, exciting, possible. And to your point, like if we don't have a well grounded critique of all the ways that these things are being manipulated, embedding you know very problematic philosophies and 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 the one that we've been the most vocal about is the financial incentives underneath like mm -hmm. if you fund these things through the blitz scaling vc architectural incentive structure then you know there's just a huge amount of you know terrible consequences to mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. but i think also like with the ai i mean you mentioned some of them in this conversation like i would also point to you know you have essentially this this heist of the knowledge commons of mm -hmm. humankind mm -hmm being privatized and mm -hmm. crammed into privatization structures just at the fundamental outset of this and then creating this arms race for as much computational, you know, NVIDIA chips as we can possibly get our hands on. And yeah, I've seen those pitch decks of like, here's why we have to to do the mining on the ocean floor, mm -hmm. right? Because th this is why. Mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, wait, <laughs> mm -hmm. how did we go? From <laughs> yeah. We have to kill it to save it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it is like you said a paradox. Yeah, um, the enthusiasm doesn't. I guess it doesn't grind my gears as much at the moment because I don't know. I kind of almost shut it out a bit. Mm. But I think it's highly problematic insofar as it's being used to justify a lot of the extractive behaviors that yeah. underpin it. Yeah, mm. important patterns to notice. Yeah, and and always I, I always find it nourishing to talk about the dark side of these things yeah. <laughs> like strangely you know it's a bit it's yeah. a bit like talking about living systems without talking about death right no let's exactly. go there right yeah because it's mm -hmm. part of the cycle and recognizing the true potential of any of these technologies i think requires a, a serious ongoing critique if you're serious about the potential totally you know i love it this is good feedback i um yeah, there's like a permaculture teacher I've learned a lot from, and he's always like, all this talk about regeneration, Matthew, but don't forget degeneration. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of death happening in nature, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other final words? No, or, that's yeah, the final that, word right I love there. It. Yeah. <laughs> David Nunn, we're going to do our best to keep up with you in the show notes and links in, uh, to all the resources and books you mentioned. Appreciate the conversation so much. Thank you so much. Total pleasure. Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Should we talk more about the dark side of crypto and tech? And also curious what you thought of the two-person format. I feel like I wanted to hear more from Don, but I also could just listen to David all day. He's obviously brilliant. Anyway, to learn more about Spherical, go to spherical.studio. And for more awesome conversations like this, go to maearth.com. We are here to elevate voices in the regenerative economy space. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.